Today on The State of Us, unite a divided America with national service and student debt. Welcome to The State of Us. I'm your host, Justin T. Weller, joined, of course, today by the one and only friendly redneck liberal and senior resident historian here at True Chat, Mr. Lance L. Jackson. Today, we're looking at two different opinion pieces from the New York Times. One is entitled, To Unite a Divided America, Make People Work for It. Wow, what a concept. What a concept. We're going to look at that and talk about making Americans crushing debt disappear. Uh, But before we dive into both topics, Lance, what is the word of the day? Well, they're going to have to be active participants instead of a looker on or a lookers on. That is our word of the day. Looker on. L-O-O-K-E-R-O-N. It is a noun. The plural is lookers on. L-O-O-K-E-R-S-O-N. Means an observer or a spectator, an onlooker. I love it. So an, don't be an a, onlooker. Yes. A looker on. Okay. Yes, a looker on <laughs> is defined as an onlooker. So do not be a looker on today. Okay. Get get active. Participate. Now is that your be a, be is a that part your of the example program. or or do we? No, I think I'm up like two nothing, three okay. nothing right oh, now. I think but I, I don't one, know what one nothing. I think is. What, I'm not yeah. sure what the rules are, but well, uh, one to zero. Got it. I'm trying. I'm trying to be a participant. I don't want to be a looker on today in the ah oh, oh, in the okay. battle to win. Gotcha. <clears> so. Uh, to unite a divided America, make people work for it. Now, if nothing else, hopefully if you've listened to this show before, you should know that Lance and I like that title, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. That sounds good to me, right? Ah, unite us through work. Hmm. Yes. Okay. But what does that actually mean? Well, the way the article opens, and I think this is, it, it, it's a, it's a fair point that kind of makes, makes us examine ourselves and say, wow, yeah, that really is kind of silly. If we Americans listen to one another, perhaps we would recognize how absurd our discourse has become. It is our own fault that political discussions today are hot headed arguments over whether the hooligans storming the halls of the Capitol were taking a tour or fomenting an insurrection. If we broadened our audiences, perhaps we would see the fallacy of claims that all Republicans are committed to voter suppression and that all Democrats are committed to voter fraud. It seems like an easy challenge to address, but we lack the incentives to change our behavior. We are all, regardless of where we sit on the political spectrum, caught in the vortex of intoxication. We have fooled ourselves into thinking that our followers on social media are our friends. They aren't. They are our mirrors, recordings of our own thoughts and images played back to us by us for us. I I was not just a looker on. I was, in fact, an active participant in the delivery of a well-written piece. I could have just monologued that, uh, but that wouldn't have been fair uh, to the author who clearly put some effort there into crafting that opening. So Lance, but the well, great, this lovely opening, right? We've got these problems. We're all idiots. Okay. We've, we've already known that. So what, right. what the heck does that have to do with national service? Well, the how point is of the article is how can it? we change this, right? How can we better deal with these problems and not be lookers on and become active participants? And the point of the article is, that a good foundation for this would be a one-year mandatory national service program between the ages of 18 and 25. <clears throat> so, and before you say, well, we can't do that. This is America. You can't make people volunteer and that's against the, con- you know, that's against the Constitution and, and everything else. Well, you know, the author points out that this idea is neither new nor partisan. That the call to serve and inspire is written into the preamble of the United States Constitution. When the founders sought to, and I quote, form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty. They were talk end, end quote, they were talking about establishing an ethos of citizenship and participation. So it can be done. It's constitutionally sound. Oh, and historically, in response to the Great Depression over 90 years ago, 
President Franklin Roosevelt created the Civilian Conservation Corps, what was then America's largest organized nationwide civilian service program. 30 years after that, in the 1960s, President Lyndon Johnson brought into fruition the President Kennedy's Domestic Peace Corps Initiative, the Volunteers in Service to America program known as VISTA. And today, domestic civilian service is dominated by AmeriCorps and non-governmental programs like Teach for America. So things already exist. We've done them in the past, and it's not unconstitutional. It's actually very common around the world. There's about 75 countries around the world that require or mandate some form of national service. Um, now, national service frequently, right, comes in the form of military service. There are many countries where that is required, right? Um, and we think of that kind of as ludicrous that what, what are you, you're required to serve in the military? What do you mean? Well, we've had drafts before, right, Lance, where we have forcibly made people serve in the military. Now, um, I think Lance and I have both advocated before that if we were going to have mandatory national service in this country, that it would be national service, which can come in a number of forms, right? So if you if serving in the military is how you wanted to satisfy that, then I think we're all for that. Great. You could do it that way, um, right? You could also do it by volunteering for a registered federal nonprofit, you know, spending time with a nonprofit. Uh, you could do it by working in AmeriCorps, right? Or uh, I don't know if national service, if the Peace Corps would qualify, because that's, uh, you know, like international stuff. Um, but, you know, there's there's a lot of different ideas there about it. I think the big thing is it sounds good in principle, right? But it's also easy for those of us who would not be obligated to do anything for it to impose that on the people that would be required to meet the requirements, mainly those people that are not yet 18. But we do that all the time, right? I mean, it is when I graduated from high school, I had to have 17 credits and two math classes and one science class. And now most places you have to have 21 or 22 credits and you have to have three years of math or four years of math and three years of science. And so we change all the time, right? I mean, that's, We've seen it in the medical profession that they've taken away the really long internships and, you know, all the old doctors would complain, oh, they didn't have to go through what I had to go through and rah, rah, rah. Well, that doesn't mean that the doctors you see now that are under 40 aren't as good at their job as the guy, the guys and gals that are over 40, you know. So I, that's kind of a weak argument when we say, well, you know, we're we're going to put this on you, but I didn't have to do it. Um, it's we should have, right? We should have done that. Maybe some of us have done our service, even though we weren't required to do it. Uh, another good point in the author is this is a, a sensible system of compulsory national service would build bridges between people and turn them into citizens. Oh my gosh. I mean, you mean you actually want to work to make your country better? That, that would be citizenship? That we, and you're against that, why? Why is it not your responsibility as well as my responsibility to make our country stronger and better and get to know each other better? And I'm not against, you know, I'll even throw this out there. If we want to do this retroactively and say every citizen has to have a year of service so that they want me to say, you know, at, at 60, almost 61 now, that... I need a years of a year of service somewhere. I'm all for that. I'm not going to ask somebody else to do something that I wouldn't have already done. Is that young people are going to say, well, you didn't have to do it. So what do I have to do it? I'm like, oh, I'm all in. I'll work side by side with you because we need to break down not just gender and sexual barriers that exist, but between the ageism that exists. You know, me working with young people my entire life, it's amazing what they think of us and what I think of them and how we prove each other wrong when we get in there and work together. You know, they're amazed this old guy can keep in there and work and outwork them and work as hard, you know, and I'm amazed at how much young people care when I start working with them side by side, shoulder to shoulder, digging a ditch, chopping wood, 
vacuuming, doing dishes, whatever. Okay. I think there's a lot to be learned by that. Lance is signing up, baby. Getting ready to go. Well, and here's, I want you to think about this while we go on the break, because again, we, we started with this whole message of unity, right? And how do we get back to being a united country? Um, and what, what is a united country? Um, well, hopefully it's a country where we don't have to agree on everything, but we can at least be civil with one another and we try to understand where other people are coming from. Oh, and, and what is that? When, when we understand where somebody else is coming from, there's a word for that, right? Empathy. Well, guess what? Multiple, multiple research projects over the past 20 years have decisively concluded that when you engage in positive volunteering experiences, your mental health improves. And how does it improve? Well, one of the number one things that contributes to improved mental health when volunteering as is an additional sense of empathy about your fellow people. Why? Well, because you are experiencing firsthand, you are there seeing them, meeting the people, hearing what struggles they're going through. And guess what? We know that as human beings, 95% of people, when they experience that stuff, are going to become more understanding. Now, does that mean that you're going to change your whole, whole worldview overnight? No. Does it mean, though, that when somebody else has a different opinion than you, that you may stop to think and say, Maybe they have that opinion because they come from a different background. Their experience is different. And maybe I shouldn't be quite so mean to them just because they didn't come to the same conclusion that I came to. And that, I think, even more so than the direct benefit, right, of this. The direct benefit is, holy crap, we'd have all these volunteers every year. And imagine what America's nonprofits could do, you know, if they had people like this to work in them. So what exactly would it look like? Um, you know, Lance is signing up either way, but what, what would it look like for people that aren't, aren't quite that eager? Well, to find out, keep it here on the state of us and we'll be right back. Don't be a looker on. If you want to unite a divided America, you got to work for it. Get in the trenches, right? Feed the hungry. Help the poor. Put people to work. Oh, serve in the military. Represent America around the world. And you only got to do it for one year. Or at least that's the author's proposal, Lance. We said, what specifically would national service look like? Well, um, the individual that wrote this article proposes universal na national service would include one year of civilian service or military service for all adults to be completed before they reach the age of 25 with responsibilities meant domestically or around the world. It would channel the conscience of the Civilian Conservation Corps and put young people in the wilderness repairing the ravages of environmental destruction. It would draw on the lessons of the Peace Corps and dispatch young Americans to distant lands where they would understand the challenges of poor countries and of people for whom basic health and nutrition are aspirational goals. It would draw on the success of our military programs that in the past created pathways toward financial stability and educational progress for those with limited resources while serving as a great unifier among America's races, religions, and social classes. Having family members that are in the military, I can tell you one thing that they all share in common, they have criticisms in the military, is that they will tell you that serving in the military absolutely helped them build an appreciation for people with different views. Because you know what? When somebody's shooting at you, you really don't care if the guy next to you is Christian or Muslim or black or white or gay or straight or male or female. You just want to know if they got your back. You know, that's what you want to know. Are they going to be there for you? And and so the point is we we have these programs, right? We know how to do these things. The goal of this is let's just do it at scale and say, before the age of 25, you are required to get this done. Then the question, though, comes into play, Lance, of a policy with no punishment is no policy, right? Right. As mm -hmm. we know with the, uh, the individual mandate for health insurance, regardless of what you think of that, uh, when the penalty was set to zero, you can say, well, legally, you have to have health insurance. Well, what happens if I don't? Well, nothing. Uh, 
okay. You know, well, great. There are people, right? There are people, and if we did this, there would be people who would do it simply because it's the rules and they want to follow the rules. And that's lovely. But we also know that if there's no consequences for it, then, eh, you know, we have a dog with no teeth. So so what do we do, Lance, about that component? Um, How about... Well, we'll throw you in jail for a year. So you give them, you give them, <laughs> I, I, I don't I, know. I mean, no, no. you kind of, you kind of threw me off there, but I'm, I'm like, well, and I, you're exactly right. I mean, I, that's a great point that if there is no punishment, then most people are rule followers and the majority of people would go ahead and do this. But what do you do with those folks who don't? And um, it, it has to be something I, you know, I, I say, okay, well, you put them in jail. But as I say that, Okay, now we're going to spend money on people who didn't volunteer, who didn't do what they're supposed to do, because it costs money to put people. We have to take care of them. I'm not sure that I really want to do that, but that would be one option. I mean, I'm not necessarily for that one, but that would be an option. Um, military service, you know, you, you automatically go into the military and say, well, but they don't want to be there. Okay, well, then they should have thought of that before they got to that point. Um, you could have some kind of fine, some kind of monetary. And I know we're going to do something about debt. So you say, well, now, you know, they can't pay that because they don't have a job and they, they've got all this college debt. Okay. Well, um, maybe then they're not eligible for federal loans because many people get student loans from the federal government or from the federal. So now you're not eligible. Oh, and you want to borrow money from a federal loan to buy a house. Well, you're not eligible because you didn't do your mandatory service. So you can hit them in those ways where it's not just tit for tat one-on-one, but then when they come later in life and say, well, I want to borrow money from the government to do this. You look down and say, oh, you didn't do your mandatory service, so no, you're not eligible for that loan. You don't get that. I, I like the idea of, you know, you get, if you're not actively completing it or um, haven't done it at all and you reach age 25, then I think you're given three months, you know, to say you must begin, you know, your active service in a civilian organization or the military. I mean, you could do whatever you want. And if you do not, within this three month period, begin that requirement, then you will then you will enter mandatory uh, mandatory military service, you know. Um, and if you go into the military service and you refuse to comply, you know, then I'm then I would be open to you know your suggestion of then if you're not going to give the nation a year of service, then you're going to spend a year in jail, you know. Um, it, it's because I mean at that point, right? It's like okay, you know. You, you couldn't, you didn't choose or, you know, you didn't want to choose and then you went to the military and then you refused to, you know, really give it an effort. So. And remember, our goal here is not to put people in jail. Our goal here is to make people better citizens, right? Where we're saying that the argument is, is if you do this, okay, if you take part in it, even if you don't want to when you start, but there's, you will find some benefits from it after you've done it and it will make you a better citizen and you might you know, you might actually start to volunteer when you're not required to. You might start to understand those people that you had never met before and become advocates for them. You might find a career doing this. You may go out and work in in food service or out in the wilderness and all of a sudden decide, you know what, this is what I want to do with the rest of my life. And you might also go out and do something for a year and say, okay, I did my service. Now I'm going to move on and do what I want to do. Okay. You know, and we haven't even gotten into the, and that's fine too, but we haven't even gotten into how many young people don't even know what they want to do. And they go to college and they get this huge debt or they, they get started in a job and they say, well, I really don't like this career. So go do your service where you can find out and try maybe two or three different things. You know, have it broken up to where you do three months with this, three months with this, you do three months with four different things and you maybe find a job that you like or a career or a field that you're interested in. And then when you go to school, you actually go to school to get a degree or to get a a license to do something that you've tried and you know you enjoy. I mean, there's so many positives here. And the, the one big negative is, well, it was a year and I became a better citizen after spending this year. Well, and I think the other thing is you, you push for that um, side of you may find your new career, right? I mean, we've talked a lot about 
either people who don't go to college and don't know what they want to do or people who go to college and don't know what they want to do. And wouldn't this be a great way to reduce some of that? Now, the last thing, and this is the big one, right? It's like, okay, we've, you know, you've convinced me guys, or you've worn me down, whatever. We're going to go for it. But then you stop and say, how are we going to pay for this? I mean, these people just have to, you know, whatever. I mean, we don't, we don't, you don't get any money. You just got to, you just got to figure out how to give a year of your life away for free. Well, now we're getting into, uh, you know, the privileged few are going to be able to, you know, work that out. But if not, then you're just stuck going to the military at 25 because you got to do something that pays you. So what do we do about that, Lance? I mean, okay. So we're, we're talking about volunteering, right? And it has to be done by the age of 25. So you're 16, 17, 18 years old. Um, you're in school. You're working. Who says you can't volunteer like in a big brother's, big sister's program? You can't volunteer uh, to oh, be somebody. so you mean I could break it knows. up? Like I could, I could volunteer four hours a week on the weekend for five years. Mm, exactly. Well, why not? Ooh, I mean, if you say, okay, okay full-time volunteers, 40 hours a week. So I could work. Times a year. So I could still have a job. Right. And rather mm. than going out and playing video games or going out with my friends all the time, I could actually do something. You know, be a candy striper at the nurse. I don't even know if they have the, you know, candy striper at the hospital. I don't know if they do that anymore. But I know that I had teenage friends that did that, you know. And you, you went from room to room and sold candy bars and newspapers and stuff and, you know, brought a bright smiling face to to those people who are in the hospital. Um, but there are all kinds of things. Sure, you know, you can, and you can volunteer at your local nonprofit, or you could also get it done by taking a year of service. And and obviously, if you worked in one of the government programs, they maybe w could house you or whatever, but not everybody would choose that. Our own employee, Bradley, does some of that, right? He does some volunteering in the medical profession. And I mean, yeah, some of it's internships, but part of it's you know, outside of his college day. I know he's he's also volunteered at the local library doing things for them and running programs for them while he's away at school. Um, so, I mean, there's there's all kinds of ways that you could do this. Nobody's saying you have to do it straight up, right? Well, and the other thing is, like, if you're familiar with AmeriCorps and the Peace Corps, um, many of those programs, right, would be happy to accept more applicants, and they already have money set aside for more applicants, um, because like, for example, part of the way it works when you're in AmeriCorps, right, is it's not that you get paid per se, um, but you do get like a living stipend and they usually help you arrange your housing. So, you know, the, the goal is, and I mean, I think AmeriCorps still says this because we were actually looking at it for one of the local nonprofits for people to participate is you're supposed to spend sort of a year in poverty, you know? Um, you're not going to have a big paycheck. Now, are you going to have a roof over your head and clean clothes and a shower and food? Yes. You know, you're going to be okay. It's not like you're going to be living in total squalor, but you are going to experience what it's like to live with not a lot of money. And for those who come from the lower end of the spectrum financially, that might be more than what they have. Because they would have their own bed. They would have yep. warm running water. They would have three square meals a day. So for for some people that would volunteer, that would be an improvement for them. Yeah. So, and I'm not saying that condescendingly at all, but I'm saying it works some on people, both that's sides. A step up, it works on both you know? sides, right. And AmeriCorps, you know, does have that goal of trying to get you, it's, it's very common for the companies, and when I say companies, nonprofits, and government institutions that AmeriCorps members are placed in, it is very common for them to be offered a job at the end of their, you know, year of service through AmeriCorps. That's very common because it's kind of like the world's longest interview, right? I mean, the company basically gets you for a year, doesn't have to pay you, you know, and they get to train you in the job and you get to work here and they get to see how you do. And if you like it and you get to see the same thing. And if at the end of that, if everybody's happy and they've invested this energy and they haven't had to pay you anything, seems like a good hire to me. So what about um, erasing our debt, Lance? We got this national service. The last thing, right? Cut the debt loose, baby. Now people, now people will be free if we just relieve them of that obligation. What do you think? Should we do that? Don't just be 
a looker on, send us an email, podcast at the state of us.org. Lance and I are not looker ons. We're actively involved and you're going to hear our answer coming up. Keep it here on the state of us. We'll be right back. One of Lance's favorite, favorite topics. Mm -hmm. He's all for just, just wipe it out. Just wipe it out. Debt, it means nothing. It means nothing. You borrow money, you say you're going to pay it back. Ah, whatever. You know, yeah, you can't. No biggie. No big deal. Oh, well. So what do we do, Lance? What's this author got to say? Because they're, 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 they're making the strong case, right? Got to get rid of it. Well, they're making a case. Oh, okay. I'm not, okay. They're I'm making sure a case. I'm not sure it's a strong case. Oh, okay. Um, I, I, I don't agree with it much, um, as you know. And do I understand that we need to do things to, to help it along and to help the economy? Yes, I do. Okay. I think we need to do more <clears throat> in the way of educating young people about money and about how the system works so that they can participate in the system and not get caught up in some of this debt um, unknowingly or unwittingly. Uh, but I have a hard time of just saying, well, you borrowed this money and now you don't have to pay it back and there are no repercussions because do you have a cell phone? Did you buy a computer? What sacrifices did you make? I mean, I understand. And then they make some points here where, you know, medically and coming out of the pandemic, people couldn't work and being hospitalized. They have medical debts that are through the roof. Those kinds of things I understand a little bit better as to now that rationale, but just for, well, I kept borrowing money, kept borrowing money because I just couldn't make ends meet. Okay. Prove to me what you gave up and did without. Because I spent many, many years without. And you say, well, I wish I could just have some furniture. Here's the boomer talking down to me. But, but we, to didn't, we didn't have new furniture. We didn't go on vacations. Oh. I didn't have a brand new car. Sacrifices? I, I made it last. It's sacrifice. It's not a boomer talking down to anybody. But I didn't have the same thing that everybody else had. I had to work for it and get there. And if that's a boomer talking down to you, then that's what I am. <laughs> but I think you need to listen because there is something who, who said, I, I, and there's a commercial out there on TV, which I know nobody sees, right? Because you're <laughs> looking at your TikTok and everything else. And especially, and especially if you're a TikTok person and you're listening to our show, double thumbs up. I am glad you're listening. Um, cause that's a, that's a big thing for me to get some young people listening, but it says, whoa, we want to be fair. And everything's about being fair. And I, I don't know what generation you guys grew up in, but I was never told life was fair. Not once in the 60 plus years I've been on this earth has any adult ever looked at me and said, you know what? You're going to live this life at, at a certain stage. And at some stage, it's all going to be fair. So to be specific, the author proposes that student loans, medical debt, utility bills, criminal justice, fines and fees and municipal debt should all be written down or canceled outright. Now, here's... You, you might be sitting here thinking, why the heck have you two paired these two things together? Like, I mean, I know you guys are desperate for stuff to talk about, but gee, many, you know, national service and, and student loan debt. Uh, well, let's take a minute, right? Let's not be looker ons here. Lance wasn't a looker on and sharing his life experience. He was very involved and we need you to be involved and critically think here. Why do they go together? Well, a huge thing for me has been, right? The student loan thing. It irks me to no end. Are student loans crushing? Yes. Have we misled young people in America? Yes. But have we misled them about loans? To me, that's a different conversation. I think what we've misled them about is that their only option is college. Because so many, and part of the reason we have crushing student debt, so many young people go to college and don't know what they want to do. But they were told that this was the only option for them to be successful. So here they are, and they spend their first couple of years trying to figure it out, and that cost a lot of money. And then they figure it out, but then they got more schooling they got to do, you know, or they, or what happens to some, right, is they spend a couple of years there and figure out, well, I don't need college for this. And then, so then they leave 
and they spent money on college they didn't need to spend. Was it valuable because they figured out what they want to do? Sure, but they have a lot of debt now as a result of that. So I think, right, there's several things that go into this. One is that we've, that we have for some reason in the United States set the bar as the only way to be successful now is to go to college. Now, I think there may have been, you know, maybe we had a time where that was true, but, you know, I was just talking to some students the other day, Lance, where, you know, shoot, out of high school, you can go get a job paying $18 an hour with full benefits, retirement, you know, health care. So don't, don't sell me that, you know, do not sell me that the only option, the only way, right, is to go to college. And I think that national service is the perfect opportunity to help people figure it out without being crushed by debt. Well, I'm going to argue with the $18 an hour, depending on where you live, is not a way to make a living. Well, in fairness, we're talking about <laughs> in in the city of Urbana in Champaign County, okay. Ohio. Okay? I was going to say, because that's only about thirty-five dollars to $40,000 a year. You're not going to make much of a living off of that. Well, then, see, then people got to get married and, you know, right, and have that combined income and well, that doesn't li- li- always live that American dream and, you know. Two people working, uh, I, two yeah. people working in the household. We talked about that. It's, <laughs> you know, it's about, yeah. it's about not being a looker on and making and getting actively participating and making the sacrifices and making the decision on what you want in life. And I'm not saying accruing a lot of money or a lot of stuff makes you successful. That's not what I'm saying. But can you find a place to live and provide the basic necessities for you and your family on the salary? And hopefully do something that gives you mm-hmm. purpose, you right. know? And, 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 and then that, that's where the, the, the service part comes exactly. in, right? Whether And you know what? People did that a lot of times through their churches. And I know that church membership, I've just read an article the other day where church membership is down in the United States again for the third year in a row. You know, people are not participating. And I'm not <clears throat> saying that that's the way to go. But you start talking about volunteers. I can remember the hours and hours and hours that my grandmother and grandfather gave to the church in a variety of different fashions. But again, oh, who do you meet there? You meet people from all walks of life when you go to church because people are constantly looking to the church for help. And you find out things and and you find out things about your community and you serve your community. So there's another volunteer reason, but it's another way that you can make your community better on top of just making money. And, and I'm not, I want to be clear. I mean, people hopefully who listen know this. I am not anti-college at all. I am anti-college for people who, who don't, at the end of the day, want or need it. And if they're going simply because they believe that's the only way for them to have a good life, then I think if that one, if that's true, if the only, if the only way to have a good life in America is to go to college, we have a problem. You know, we have a problem. One, I don't think that's true. You know, but if you want to make the argument that it is true, then we have a problem because we shouldn't be requiring people to spend tens and tens of thousands of dollars or hundreds of thousands of dollars to have a semi-okay life. I think that's wrong. That's not what this country should be about. Now, if the job you want to go into that's going to fulfill you and make you happy or the income requirement that you want requires you to get a college degree and you want to go down that road, more power to you, all for it. But I think that part of the problem is that people don't know that things like AmeriCorps and the Peace Corps, or they don't really entertain them, or they're just sold the message. And the nice thing about the national service component is the number one thing that this article is proposing, which is the cancellation of student debt, I think this will make a huge dent in that. Because you'll have so many people that upon completing their national service, say they want to go to college, they're probably going to go in and have a very clear idea of what they'd like to do. You know, instead of, well, I don't really know, you know, and you'll have a lot of people that never go in the first place because one of two things, either they'll know definitively what they don't want to do, right? Or they'll know what they want to do, or they may have gotten hired by one of those companies who said, yeah, you know, we spent a year training you and, and you've done a really good job and we know you don't have a degree, but you know, we're happy to hire you because you know what you're doing. You know, you, you had, you got a year of education on this job. You know, well, what do you mean? Edu- well, okay. Yeah, they didn't get a degree, but they got a year of education, you know, and now that company wants to hire them. I don't think that, I, I think that all of those things are valuable. And the last thing I would say, Lance, then is I would ask people to consider, should you have to complete all or some of your national service before being allowed to attend higher education? 
In other words, it would not be it would not be legal for a college or higher education institution to accept you if you haven't either started, completed, or done some portion of your national service. And and that's a there's a lot of details there. I'm throwing it out there for people to think about. Maybe it's all or nothing. You know, you got to be done, and then you can come. Or maybe it's you know you got to be halfway done, and then you can come. Um, I think the simpler the better, though. Uh, because we we don't want people to loophole around it. You know, we need it to just be straightforward and the expectations should be clear. Um, but I think that that's an interesting notion because I think it'll make for better college students too, right? If you're more empathetic and you've been out in the world and you've seen some things, you're probably more likely to value the education that you're getting in the institution that you're at. Well, and then the college performs better and then you do a better job at college. Wow. You know, I mean. No, that's what I did. I, I mean, I went, just, through, I went for two years and, and basically dropped out, went into the workforce, figured out what I wanted to do, went back to school. I was a much better student because I knew what I wanted to do and I learned more. And uh, everything you just described is exactly the way my life went. Okay. And I was 25 years old when I started my career. Yep. So don't be a looker on. Uh, you got to be part of this conversation. Send us an email, podcast at the state of us.org. Um, Got to be active. Yes or no? Make people work for it. United Divided America. So why we have this conversation today, Lance? Well, what are we trying to do? Because here at True Chat, we have a mission. And our mission is to educate people by providing honest, open, and respectful conversations. We've done that again today, and hopefully you enjoyed it. Share it with others. And when they say, well, I'd like to listen to some more of this, where can I find these guys? Well, as a podcast, we're on Spotify, Overcast, Stitcher, Apple Podcast, and everywhere podcasts are found. The State of Us is available Tuesdays and Thursdays as a podcast, first thing in the mornings, and we're heard on the weekends on radio stations, AM and FM radio around the country. For the State of Us on True Chat in Urbana, Ohio, what do you got, Lance? Final score? I didn't. I just worked ah! hard. I just worked hard to win. Okay. I, I I think I got the win. I, I think we pulled it out. But maybe what do you mean you pulled it out. Did you count your last one? Your last one didn't count. I, I had not thrown it to you yet. That was Bradley's. Mm, that was Bradley. It's, it's once I ask you why we're here today. That's the. That's the. <laughs> so you get you you get so you get to keep score. Look at the score. Decide how many times you have to say it to get the win, and then throw it to me, and then you get the win. Why are you not undefeated? <laughs> I, I should do better then. Shouldn't you I? should do better. <laughs> uh, just throwing that yeah. out there. But Wait, again, we're, 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 I'm not complaining because, like I said, life's not fair. That's we, just we, the, we, we just play that, by Bradley's rules. That's just the way it goes, right? Just. Yep. to stay consistent. We're behold. I, I don't want the listeners to get on me saying, well, you just said in the show that life's not fair. <laughs> I'm just pointing out another, here's another case, folks, where <laughs> life is not fair. The uh, game is tilted against you and you just do the best you can. Yep. I didn't set these rules. Play by the it rules. It was Bradley. Right. Who's my subordinate. But <laughs> <laughs> mm, something funky there, right? Like yeah, I, I didn't uh, make the rules. Yeah. Now I tell the person who makes the rules what to do. But. Right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> like I said, life it's not fair, folks. Just another example to prove uh, my point. I'm Justin T. Weller. I'm Lance Jackson. Special thanks to that extraordinary producer who knows what type of rules to make, Bradley Butch. And thank you all, our audience, for tuning in. We'll see you next time. Be the change. Be sure to check out our website, thestateofus.org, for books, articles, and all the ways to tune in. Thestateofus.org.